This conference afternoon, will now be everybody. recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the RTD Accountability Committee Operations Subcommittee. It's Wednesday, October 7th, 2020 at 3 p.m. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, Melinda, could you read off who we have on the meeting, please? Absolutely. All right, so it looks like we have Matthew Helfant, Melinda Stevens, Ron Pastor, Barbara McManus, Dea Zavala, Elise Jones, Jeff Becker, Jordan Sanchez, Julie Duran Mullica, Kristen Trustman, Matt Callison, Natalie Shishido, Nicole Carey, Rep Bridges, and Troy Whitmore. Uh, we also have two uh, people who are on the phones. Uh, can the callers maybe just shout out your names, who you are for the record? Michael Ford. Okay. Jeff Becker. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. And uh, there you go, Matthew. Thank you, Melinda. We'll move on to uh, the meeting summary from September 24th. If anyone has any comments, suggested changes, uh, please uh, please send me an email. Uh, but there, there, uh, no formal action needs to be taken. And now we'll move on to uh, the discussion items. Uh, there's, uh, there's really just one. Uh, so equity and and transit service planning discussion. Um, last meeting at, on uh, September 24th, we we heard an overview from RTD on how RTD does their service planning. And so uh, today I will just go through uh, some some basics in in in, in service planning. Uh, much of it uh, is very similar to uh, what RTD does, uh, but so I will go rather quickly through it and then we'll have a, a, an opportunity to start our discussion in earnest. So I am just going to go down, I'm sorry? It's Chris Frampton, I just wanted to let you guys know I was here. I don't know if you did oh, a roll call. Oh, thank you, Chris. One seven four nine six three number. Thank you, Chris. All right. So um, there, there are there are variations on on how this is done, uh, but uh, generally, uh, uh, most philosophies in transit service planning conform to something like this. Uh, there, uh, there are there are some essential elements that that are interconnected uh, when trying to uh, figure out um, how to plan service for 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 a transit for a transit agency. Um, you have to consider uh, the design, you have to consider equity, you have to consider performance and and budget. So for budget, you you're really talking about the the resources uh, that that you have and that you can devote. Uh, that this is almost always a finite number. Uh, you have to figure out what you what you can realistically devote. Uh, then and you have to consider all the costs. So uh, the costs of the rolling stock, the the vehicles, uh, the operating costs, uh, the the paying for the uh, the employee, the operator. Uh, to drive the vehicle is is the largest of those costs, but also uh, fuel is important too. And you have to also consider maintenance uh, of that vehicle, and then um, complementary paratransit. So in um, in the United States, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it requires uh, complementary paratransit for all or, or almost all. Uh, fixed route uh, bus and train services. And so what this means is within three quarters of a mile of the fixed route service that you are providing, you must provide uh, complementary service uh, for any uh, individuals with disabilities who have barriers in the way of taking advantage of that fixed route service. 
And so you have to make sure that, that, that you, you plan for that as well, because that, that could be a significant cost. And so performance, um, how will you measure it? Uh, is it some combination of ridership, cost, travel time, re reliability, um, other, other, um, other uh, performance measures as well? Uh, but also, you have to make sure that whatever you measure, you're able to collect the appropriate data. Otherwise, uh, you're, you're, uh, you could choose to measure something, but um, you're, you're not going to be able to measure it. So that's something that you want to make sure that you can do. And then also, you want to compare uh, the performance of the particular route that, that you're that you're planning for uh, with, with other peers uh, in, uh, in, in, in amongst the uh, services that you provide. So last week, Jeff uh, showed us um, that there were several different service categories. For instance, um, uh, service, bus service and the CBD and, and uh, suburban bus service and light rail, just for example. And the routes amongst those categories get compared with each other and not to, uh, to services within other categories. And that's important because you can't, you can't expect to have the same performance on, on a route that's uh, in the suburbs uh, to, let's say, uh, um, a light rail service, for example. Uh, they're, they're two completely different services, and you shouldn't compare them uh, with each other. So then design, um, the service level, frequency. And um, there, there, was a, there was a link to, um, to, uh, to an article about, uh, a, about service planning uh, that, that um, uh, was in your packets, and one of the key points about frequency was made in there um, that was that really painted a picture. Uh, so uh, imagine yourself living in a house and having a gate in front of your driveway, and um, that gate can only open two times an hour or four times an hour. Uh, you're you're going to be concerned about uh, how uh, you know t making sure that the timing works for you, but you're going to feel how how limiting that that is that you can't leave any time you want and you have to always plan ahead. Um, but it all service level also includes just how many how many hours of service how, uh, and then uh, are you providing that service on weekdays, weekends, evenings. Uh, all of that needs to be considered. Uh, vehicle standards and type. So is it going to be on a bus, a light rail, a commuter rail, uh, etc.? cetera? Um, and then service delivery. Is it fixed route? Is it demand response? Is it some kind of hybrid? Um, kind of like uh, RTD's flex ride, it, I, I would consider a hybrid. It, it's um, the, the, the buses are going uh, within a certain geographic area, and you can you can call and make arrangements, or go online and make arrangements uh, for for a particular trip. But they're generally going in 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 one pattern over and over again within that geographical area. Then geography, uh, you know, the, the built environment certainly is is, is a factor. Uh, you know, it's very different if you're providing this downtown versus uh, uh, suburban or, or rural. Um, and then there's the the ridership uh, coverage trade-off, which that article that we that I that we provided the link to um, also discusses. And so there's two ends of the spectrum, and typically you find yourself somewhere in the middle, right? So um, you know, you can maximize for ridership, but then you're you're giving up coverage. And obviously, RTD is in a situation where they have this huge swath of land uh, that that's within the RTD boundaries. 
Um, and uh, if they were to go all the way into the, the coverage part of the trade-off, then uh, with a finite budget, there, there would be limited amount of service that they can provide. Uh, and the frequency, for example, uh, would be very light if, if service was being provided in, at, at, in every square inch of, of, of their uh, significant uh, service area. So there, 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 there's a balance there. And then equity. And uh, you know, the, you want to make sure that that you're providing service for uh, to, for populations that need the transit the most. Uh, older adults, minorities, low income, individuals with disabilities, uh, zero car households, for example. Um, how how well are these populations being well served throughout? Your, your service boundary. And then of course, there's geographic and, uh, equity. You have a situation with RTD where, uh, you know, uh, everyone who, who resides within the, the boundaries and, and even people who live outside of those boundaries are, are paying to fund the service. And so you wanna take that into consideration as well. Um, and then, so there was uh, there was a, um, a a paper that we provided as well uh, called Best Practices in Transit Service Planning, uh, and it, it provides a solid background. It, it is a bit outdated. Uh, it's from uh, 2009, uh, but it uh, the 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 case studies that were provided uh, aren't very dissimilar to uh, what Jeff described. Um, Generally, um, and then for many of the the case studies, equity was certainly a consideration, uh, but it, it didn't seem to be a, a priority. And I'm and I'm not saying that these agencies haven't changed, and I'm not saying that RTD doesn't take equity as a priority at all. This was just a general observation about uh, the what was provided in the article. And so then there was, as I said, um, the article that, that we had the link for, um, the Transit Ridership Recipe by, by Jarrett Walker, who's a, a famous urbanist um, who, who does a lot of consulting work for transit agencies around the country and around the world. And so there, there is that, that ridership coverage trade-off that I mentioned. Uh, Talked also about uh, you know why frequency matters. Uh, remember the, the the picture that that I painted earlier about supposing you're living in a home and you have a gate in front of your driveway and you can only leave twice or, or three or four times an hour. Uh, what does that mean to you? And and um, uh, how will you think about uh, how? Uh, what characteristics of transit are the most important to you at that point? Is, is frequency going to be important or is travel time reliability going to be important? Um, probably the frequency is going to be more important at, at that point. And then, of course, the, all of the trade-offs that go along with it and the factors uh, to consider when uh, deciding uh, where transit uh, should run. So. With that, just wanted to provide a little bit of background, but now, um, now I think it's appropriate uh, for uh, the group to start discussing um, what factors are, uh, do you see as important uh, when, um, when uh, thinking about how RTD, uh, uh, thinking about recommendations for how RTD could um, possibly improve uh, it, its um, ser transit service planning. Matthew, uh, this is Chris Winston. Do, do you guys use any kind of net promoter score, Scotty? I'm sorry? 
Do you use and, and I've got really terrible Chris? service. I'm sorry. Do you use any kind of or do we use any kind of net promoter score methodology uh, where you know in order to sort of judge quality of service? Um, you know, I, I haven't really seen any of that in, in, in the literature, uh, but, uh, yeah, you're, me. you're more than welcome to, if there's something that you have to, to, to bring it into the conversation, and we'll certainly be discussing this, uh, for multiple meetings, I'm guessing. So, um, sure. if there's something you'd like to share, uh, for us to, uh, to discuss, that would well, be great. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty big effort. A, a net promoter score is, is really a concept where you're essentially asking a very simple question, which is, would you recommend this product or service to somebody else? And then that, that metric, which is, a, is one question survey, is then used as an organizing principle for really all of the other decisions, from financing to to service, to operations, to employees, to employee incentive programs, et cetera. Um, there, there are very big companies. Um, Amazon is, is one of the leaders in using Net Promoter Score. Um, it's, a, it's, it's both widely accepted practice and yet in, in a lot of ways new um, process for how to think about um, you know, how we're doing. Um, and, and the idea is that all of the all of the metrics that we're considering, all the data that we're considering gets sort of judged against that. Uh, it's a big move um, for sure, and, and, um, uh, but, but lots of companies have had success, and I, I thought it, it, it's always possible that someone's already gotten an initiative started inside of RTD around that. So um, it, you know, it, I think we'll talk about a lot in the operations subcommittee, those kinds of things. So um, at, least, at least one component is, do I enjoy riding the bus and would I recommend other people ride this bus? Um, so there you go. It's, it, it's that kind it's, it, it's a, it's a really easy question and yet it, to unpack it is a massive effort. <laughs> so I don't want to suggest it's some panacea in any way, shape or form, but it's, it's something that's being done more often. I will say in um, Jarrett Walker's off Jarrett Walker's op article, um, he talks yep. about um, uh, the, the 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 quality of of the transit. Uh, you know, how is how 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 is the ride? Uh, are the operators friendly? Things like that. But then he also talks. He says that's all that that's all good um, to to have. Uh, but uh, in, in the transit game, in his opinion, um, if the it the the, so the the key elements are. Is it going where I need to go, and does it get me there uh, conveniently? Yeah, and Net Promoter Score really would consider that because okay. let's say that we gave, we gave everybody a limousine um, to get around, and we gave them Wi-Fi, and we played music, and we had an open bar, and that was what you got. But it took you two hours two to hours, get two hours, you know. Two hours, two hours. Sorry, sorry, I apologize. I'm not sure why that's happening. Ouch. I don't think that's me. Uh, I'm not sure where that echo is coming from. I'm not sure where it is either. Matthew, just, uh, I guess uh, I was not able to attend the last call. The last I'm, just call and I'm just curious if we were provided from RTD sort of the measurements of how they're doing in terms of providing service to the various categories of vulnerable populations. Um, some of the data that would help us understand what what's the current uh, lay of the land that we're experiencing now versus where we might want to get go. Has that information been provided? Jeff, I, I heard you on the line. I see you. Um, I know that RTD regularly conducts environmental justice and Title VI analysis, any service changes are proposed. Also, I know I've seen in the past that there have been um, rider surveys conducted um, that have focused on 
uh, vulnerable populations, but I haven't seen any recently. Jeff, uh, is there um, uh, anything you can add? Uh, sure, uh, Jeff Becker, RTD Service Development. Um, no, you're correct. Uh, we we do both Title VI and environmental justice evaluations for all our services and changes that are proposed. Uh, we do conduct uh, onboard rider satisfaction surveys that I'm not sure we ask this specific question would you recommend, but you know, overall satisfaction and satisfaction with all, all other kinds of things. Um, we do ask questions about the person answering it so that you know, we might know income level, you know, and, and other aspects about the, the person. Um, so it can be broken down that way. Um, we can even, uh, we have um, maps that show where, you know, where there's more low income people or people of color, for example, and we can o easily overlay the, our riders, our um, service network over top of them. And you can see how things like that match up. So, Yes, there are ways for you to see how that how that goes. This is hey guys, it's Chris again. I know I had a volume problem there. I, I was going to note that Net Promoter Scores, uh, as and I'm, again, I'm not saying we do it. I think what was just mentioned might be effective too. Net Promoter Scores can be broken down by groups, and so when we're thinking about equity, you know, how are we doing across groups? Um, and and importantly, I was trying to say. It's not just about the quality of the ride. Did you have a good experience on the bus? But also, was it convenient? Did it come when you needed to, et cetera? All of those things sort of play in. Would you recommend it again? And, and um, so it, it, in the forest, as as I think that's the, it sounds like they're doing a lot of that kind of thinking and us understanding that will be helpful. So, apologies if I messed up the sound. No, that was great, Chris. Thank you. And this is, Ron Papsdorf, I was going to, you know, Commissioner Jones, this question did come up at the last meeting, and I, I, I'm still trying, I'm, I'm personally still trying to sort of understand exactly how in the service planning work and sort of the, the couple time a year service review work that RTD does, where where that equity consideration does come in. It, it, it Title VI environmental justice sort of review tends to be sort of a post decision review that we have to do as as recipients of federal funds in the transportation world to demonstrate to the federal government that we're not you know overly negatively impacting vulnerable populations or that we're not disproportionately negatively impacting them. Um, it's I'm still trying to understand in terms of the RTE service planning how how much that's a factor in making decisions proactively uh, before decisions are made rather than sort of as an evaluation tool post decision making um, how that's factored into staff level recommendations to the board and to and to local jurisdictional and, and other stakeholder partners. Well, because I think that that's kind of a key piece to the degree that you know, we are prioritizing equity as is one of the things we want to look at. Um, knowing how well those populations are being served by this transit system could inform recommendations from this body to RTD about uh, some fundamental shifts. Um, and it could be part of the fundamental shift is including um, this analysis at the front end to drive route planning rather than an after the fact sort of check the box piece of it but it would be helpful to know right now how well are we doing how much of the identified vulnerable populations which i think is the term on your slide deck how much what percentage of those populations are being served now by rtd and is that good enough my sense is it's not but i don't know that we have that data so that would be helpful i think to inform this discussion I think the other thing that I would just add to Lisa's comments is that I seem to remember from Reimagine RTD that there was some some of that information that was being pulled as we were thinking about the service optimization plan, or at least as, as that group was thinking about the service optimization plan that we may want to at least bring into this conversation. I think the other thing that would be helpful um, 
if I remember correctly, again, from Reimagine, they were pulling cell phone data to see what ridership was looking like at that point in time. Again, this was old data from, I think, 2019, but it would be helpful if it's possible to get more current information on what that looks like. Um, I mean, I think Jeff provided us some information last week on what ridership currently looks like, especially on the high use routes, but I think having some, some more real time information might be helpful. I think the other just comment that I want to make um, in terms of, of transit equity, I mean, it, it it certainly seems like Title VI, I think that's, that's, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like Title VI is really focused on limiting further harm and not necessarily advancing equity. And so I, I, I think there might be an opportunity, I think to Elise's point, but also just more broadly, to really shift how we think about it. It's not only about limiting harm, but really how is this public transit system advancing our regional equity and not just meeting these, these very um, uh, specific goals or, or whatever that the federal government has established, but how do we actually advance equity in our region in a different way? So I just wanna offer that, especially from an operations standpoint, as, as something that we should consider as a committee. Um, this is Jeff Becker. I, I would just add that um, it certainly would be worthwhile and uh, to go to the uh, reimagined folks and they have done exactly what you said. Matthew can ask them for some of the maps that show the different types of transit um, equity population and what types of service they are now they're getting. Now, this is not during COVID, but um, before that. And that would be probably quite illuminating for you. Uh, the other thing is we do have in our service policies and standards section 11, which is standards for, uh, for service for transit dependent persons and to social service destinations, which emphasizes that we take a look at all of that. And, and and we do, um, and we hear about that, you know, anytime we may want to make changes. So it's, and uh, all that occurs before decisions are made. Uh, we'll make proposals and we'll um, make changes based on what um, people uh, say about those changes. I can recall a number of being impacted. For example, the School of the Blind, uh, uh, Said that some of our changes would really impact them, and so we made changes to, you know, to help that out as, as an example. Um, so this is an ongoing process where uh, these considerations are made. Whether you want to promote it more or make it a higher priority is something else for this committee to discuss. You know, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind answering. Um, how does RTD? What is the general consensus today about how RTD is doing around issues of equity? Was there a particular person you were asking? No. So, sorry. We're a bit of a group here. Yeah, sorry. Um, I yeah, I was going to just respond real quickly. I forgot I, I, I muted myself. Um, in, in, in regards to people, you know, Title VI protected people or low income people or social service destinations and all like that. Um, yeah, there is, uh, now I forgot what your question was. There is, um, how are uh, we doing on issues around equity? But yeah, Title VI and right. right. Yeah. The, 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 those areas are the greatest source of our ridership, um, or you say low income and people of color and and transit dependent people. So they actually, you'll see if you were to look at these maps and all, that that's where the most ridership is. It has the most routes and the most frequency of service and the most ridership. I guess, and are there areas that you've identified to date and a lot of efforts going on that, that you think could be improved? And, and and by the way, if others wanted to weigh in, that would be fine. 
Yeah, I, I was just going to weigh in. I think it may also be worth a, worth framing the question a, a little bit differently. Um, understanding that this is really, you know, RTD has done a good job of, of providing service to these populations, but are they ultimately getting to where they need to get in a, in a fast and efficient manner? You know, how many transfers do they have to do? How many, you know, how many hours are they spending on transportation? I think that's really the question that we should Great be question. unpacking um, rather than do they have a bus line? Um, but it, you know, is it actually serving them in the way that they need to be serviced? So taking it from more of a user perspective. Thank you, Daya. Um, so one thing, uh, as many of you know, Dr. Cog is currently working on its. Uh, we're currently working on our uh, 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, and part of that will include. An, an environmental justice analysis of the plan, uh, of the network that's established in the plan um, it, on, the, uh, on the planning horizon. And so we're, we're going to look uh, two different ways at, um, at, at vulnerable populations and um, how long it takes them uh, to uh, be able to take transit and for that matter, we're also going to be looking um, uh, automobile traffic, but um, how long it takes them to take transit to get to um, key destinations, whether it be um, places of employment, places of education, places of healthcare, uh, places to go uh, shopping, um, et cetera. So, um, so we, we will take that into account in, in two different ways. Uh, so. We will look at concentrations of vulnerable populations that, while they include the, um, the two populations identified in the executive order for environmental justice, which are minority and low income populations, we expand it to also include um, individuals with disabilities, older adults, zero car households, many of the populations that um, were on one of the one of the earlier slides. And but we're going to take that a step further uh, by also looking at members of those populations that don't live in concentrations so that we can complement it. And so that'll be more of a population-based approach, whereas the the the, the concentrated approach is the more traditional approach. So we will we will be doing that for our next 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. So uh, that is one way to look at the current system and then compare it to the system that's outlined, the, the network that's outlined uh, in our um, in our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Fascinating. I didn't mean to make it so quiet after I spoke. No, I I was just saying it makes you think. I mean, it's just fascinating. It's just an amazing, like interesting thing. I guess not. Well, not. To, oh, go sorry. Go, I I was just gonna say not to put you on the spot, Kristen, but I am kind of curious since since you are representing. Um, you know, folks that are, are potentially using Accessoride, if you have anything else to add around this you know, equity conversation? Uh, not really. Accessoride is an on-demand service, but it's also a, and we're told this all the time, it is still public transportation, meaning you could be on the bus with four other people, so yeah, it will take you an hour and a half to get where you're going or it could just be you and it'll take 15 minutes. So as far as the, as equity and accessoride, there's really not a lot to go with. I mean, you, you have to take what you get 
as far as I will call and say, okay, I have an appointment at Anschutz at 1015. And the reservationist will say, okay, well, there are three other people that are going to Anschutz. I'm going to start in Lakewood. They're going to start in Westminster. And then there's another person that's going to be in Aurora. So then they pick me up first, then they go to Westminster, then they go to Aurora, and then they go to Anschutz. So I'm on the bus for an hour and a half to get to Kansas, which is basically where Anschutz is. So the equity is kind of built in with Accessoride. They're going to get you there. You don't have much of a choice of how, how long it's going to take. I'm grateful that I have the service. I'm willing to take what I get and I always have a book. So I don't really know exactly where you're going with the equity. Am I answering what you wanted me to answer, Dea? Yeah, I think that's helpful, especially given that um, there's some relationship, at least from what I understand, between fixed route service and accessory rides. So that's, that's helpful. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. It's and and thank you for the question. It accessoride is a completely different animal. So I we're we're comparing oranges to apples. Just remember that um, the accessoride is linked to the fixed route because um, it, it it's required within three quarters of a mile of a fixed route. So if a decision is made to cut a fixed route, then there, there, there's also the considerations and, and consequences that uh, for, the, for the accessoride service, uh, because if you happen to live near or have a destination that you need to go to within three quarters of a mile of that fixed route, and there's no other fixed route within three quarters of a mile, then all of a sudden you you may not have that service available to you anymore. And that's very true, Matt. Uh, the good thing is with RTD and, and all these route cuts that they've been doing, they are making sure that excess ride is not being impacted, which is awesome because otherwise people really would be stranded or they would have to cross the street to get to to get excess ride. It, there's lots of ways you can tweak the, the service, but RTD has done very well as far as not cutting excess ride when they cut routes. That's that's a good perspective. I I, I didn't know um, you know um, how how well they they had been doing uh, with respect to that. So I'm glad to hear that. I just to broaden this, I know we're focused on service planning, and obviously the the first stop is whether or not there's actually a route there that's serving um, certain populations. The other piece of it is um, also whether or not they can afford to use that route. So um, fare levels and um, availability of passes is also a piece of that. I think it's sort of getting at Dea's point, which is um it's it's not just is there a bus anywhere near them but whether or not it's it's affordable is a key piece of that as well and that and, was uh that was a point of go ahead oh i was just going to say that was a point that was um brought up uh in the last meeting and rtd um within the last i think day did start to get us some some data on um, on the the pass usage. It's pretty limited, so um, and, and we got it after it was time to to send out um, the uh, the materials for this meeting. But we can um, we can it, it's available and um, we can all study it and and have a discussion uh, about that in the next meeting if if people choose. So I'd like to I'd like to pose a question to the take the liberty of posing a question to the subcommittee members. <clears throat> if for argument's sake, 
say that at least for the next couple of years because of COVID, maybe long term just because of some structural challenges with RTD's revenue sources and, and cost structure, that sort of <clears throat> the sustainability of RTD providing transit services is hindered. And part of that, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on how much of that is related to sort of that where RTD falls on that spectrum of sort of coverage um, to its entire service territory versus efficiently kind of cost-effective, efficient ridership, maximizing ridership spectrum um, of planning service. And, you know, is, the, is it just not cost-effective for RTD to meet the expectations of folks in the RTD service district to provide some level of service to its entire service territory? Or should we, you know, should RTD service territory be shrunk at, to an area that it can actually cost effectively serve? Um, and I, I'd be curious about sort of whether that's a line of thought or of investigation the subcommittee might be interested in pursuing. I think that's absolutely something we do need to consider, Ron. The other thing is, we don't need to send a a large coach to Evergreen in the morning for the three passengers. We could, RTD could start to implement different size vehicles for different routes and the different numbers of passengers on those routes. It's an idea. I know um, we were we were told those of us that were in the APAC committee, that I think RTD has a contract out with Ford, I believe, for minivans and other wheelchair accessible vehicles, just smaller than a typical fixed route bus. Don't quote me on that. You're gonna quote me on that. But if you go back I'm to, sorry, I'm sorry about that. I haven't been in APAC now. They kicked me out. Um, no, they didn't kick me out. I termed out. But that was probably at the beginning of 2019 that we were told that. But I, thanks for those comments, Kristen. I think those are important points. And, and I appreciate the question, Ron. I mean, it's just, it's always a, a trade-off, right? Ridership coverage. and. Um, Part of me, if we were just going to focus on high ridership and the overlap with um, transit dependent populations, we might just focus all the resources in downtown Denver, which obviously is not going to work for those of us who come from other parts. And it's not going to, so there needs to be some, if we're paying into a system, there needs to be some service. And I find myself wanting to go back towards a sub-regional model um, where you, and maybe it's county by county, within each county, you do an assessment of uh, of the sort of serving the efficiently transit dependent and, and commuter populations, um, recognizing you can't serve everywhere, but at least you have some service in every county or, or you know, some, every chunk of the district just for geographic fairness and because there's a you can't expect the revenues to come in if there's no service but i think that way there's a um you can sort of in county by county figure out what are the populations that need that service have those local governments be a part of the planning but try to be efficient within that geography that maybe that's a, a better model than trying to serve every part of the vast RTD territory. And also then if, if local communities are a part of that service planning, then they might be willing to leverage local funds to enhance it as well. Yeah, yeah. and I don't have a particular idea. I just, you know, I look at RTD's service boundary, which goes, includes all of Jefferson County, right? And Jefferson County is sort of a longish, skinny-ish county and to I mean for RTD to, to provide some sort of transit service to the far reaches of Jefferson County does that make a lot of sense 
in terms of being able to cost effectively serve that and what sort of sacrifices is the rest of the RTD territory making in order to provide some base level of transit service to those far reaches of Jefferson County. And, and Commissioner Jones, I'd, 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 you know, just to be fair, I might say the same thing about sort of the far west sections of Boulder County that are much more rural, right? And don't have um, a lot of population or, or destinations. And I think those are, you know, looking around the edges so that we can maintain RTD as a viable uh, transit service provider for the bulk of the region. Maybe that's that those are places to kind of look to kind of adjust the boundary a little bit. I just want to offer, I mean, I think Ron, the, the question that you're asking is is an important question. I mean, I know yesterday the the board um I, I think it was the planning and fast tracks committee received an update on what the economic recovery looks like. And I think um the former economist for the city of Denver now over in Broomfield had suggested that really recovery is not going to start until about late 2022, 2023. So whatever whatever this committee um, really proposes as a recommendation to RTD will will essentially work through the recovery of, of COVID-19 and well into, I think, the longer term recovery as well. Um, and I think the question that we'll need to wrestle with is, you know, how do do we cover the entire the entire district, or how do we actually focus where we know ridership exists um, and where we know uh, businesses are are actively moving folks to and from? Um, people are act are using the transportation to get to and from healthcare and necessary services um, in the event that there is another shutdown, which could very likely happen. I think that's a good um, point. I also the until we have recovery from COVID, you're not going to have the large uh, numbers of commuting workers. But once you do, that's going to change who, how RTD operates, who they need to serve. And I, I, I know this from a parochial basis. For example, you know that Flatiron Flyer that runs from Boulder to Denver is a very, very important route that carries a lot of people in normal times. But now that people aren't going to work, it isn't. So it makes sense to make cuts there now. But that does not make sense in the long term when the economy is back and running. You absolutely don't want that pollution and that traffic happening along that corridor. It's a very transit uh, because and people it has high ridership because people like to, to ride buses from this area. So I, I, I keep noticing that there's the next year plus where we're in COVID recovery, where we might have recommendations that do not make sense for the long term, the post recovery world. And um, I just want us to be mindful that um, there is that dichotomy. So if I could uh, belabor that point, and give everyone a phrase. This is Chris. Um, we, we are calling that inside of our company. Uh, there's near normal and new normal, and we should not confuse the two. That that there's this kind of near normal, the lingering effects of the pandemic cause one sort of reaction, but it is not what we'll do five years from now. And I do think that is important to remember. I feel like every time I so, talk, I shut up. Um, no, I'm going I'm I'm <laughs> to steal that phrase, Chris, because I really, I really like that um, thought, because I've been thinking about the same thing in a lot of the work that we do. Yeah, I think it's a great point. It, 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 although I, I, if I could to, 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 to tailgate on that, I, I also see this as a kind of a unique opportunity um, that, that while we are all going to be forced to struggle with the uh, pandemic for longer than any of us would like, um, it, it, is a, it is a little bit of a, while, while RTD staff will have a lot of work to do, it is a little bit of a breather moment to think about um, what we can look like coming out. Totally agree with and that. Going along with, with, with this with this moment that we have, and piggybacking on Commissioner Jones's um, idea of the sub-regional model, uh, and I'm I'm not suggesting this, but just wanted to open this up 
to 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 see if if there's any conversation or or thought around it. Not every um, not every metro area in the United States has one uh, significant uh, transit agency. Uh, for instance, there are several different transit agencies in the um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and they each have their own niches. Um, going along with that uh, sub-regional model, um, it is is this something worth at least discussing as a as a committee? It's certainly different in San Francisco, right? You've got Caltrain and the San Francisco group coming together, and then there's somebody else running the suburban system. Um, and it is interesting to watch them interact. And, um, it's a fascinating model. I, I don't know if and it's it certainly does, It certainly doesn't come without its challenges. Obviously, there's a lot of coordination has to happen that doesn't necessarily have to happen when you have one chief um, uh, transit agency for the entire region. Uh, but yeah, uh, to, to belabor that point, we actually did a little work on Transbay, their big union station, if you will, uh, right there in the middle of town. And the, the five different agencies, I think, that had to come together, and it certainly created a lot of consternation <laughs> about that. It was a lot easier to do in Asia when there was really that one transit agency. But that's that's a small real estate. Um, well, I I'm biased because I brought up the idea, but I think that that's something that's being looked at sort of in the governance subcommittee as a potential model to work to improve the partnerships between. Um, RTD and the, the communities it serves. So looking at um, a different operation structure, I think would make sense just to explore it. I know that uh, the Jeffco Local Coordinating Council had Ed Newberg at one of our meetings and we brought up maybe some kind of partnership between RTD and Lakewood Rides which only covers the city of Lakewood and maybe some kind of partnership to take the load off of Accessoride. And I don't know what happened with that. It kind of went off into the ether because of COVID, but that is one of the things that I think that RTD should consider as far as, as like Lee said, partnering with some of these smaller local transportation groups. And uh, in, in the realm of uh, human service transportation, transportation of, uh, that's provided by these smaller agencies uh, that focuses on um, specific populations, um, that's more of a demand response nature, um, coordination amongst those various transportation providers um, uh, is something that has been encouraged in, in our region. Um, there are uh, various funding sources that, that, um, that, that are used to, to help with the provision of those services, and many of those funding sources are now coordinated uh, by Dr. Cog. Um, also, there is a project by Dr. Cog, and I'm not trying to promote us, but um, there, there, there is a project that we're working on uh, that uh, is building or it has built technology uh, to help those transportation providers uh, work with each other so that they're able to provide uh, more trips and have less trip denials. And um, those trips are often provided at a, at a much lower cost than Accessoride. Um, and uh, so uh, investment in those services could, um, could, could help um, RTD uh, by um, 
uh, help having uh, making it so that they they don't have to provide as many of those costly trips. So um, what, with, with uh, we don't have much time left, but uh, can we have a quick conversation about um, what specific um, uh, topics we want to delve further into uh, at the next meeting? Uh, the ones that I've written down are about um, the, the fair levels and the availability of passes and just access uh, 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 for um, uh, and, uh, when it comes to cost and fares, there's the um, the level of service uh, versus the level of of coverage. That um, trying to figure out that model, and then there's also uh, the sub regional model discussion to be had as well. Um, does anyone have any preferences uh, so that we can steer the conversation to something more specific? Uh, at the next meeting. Well, I think those are all good topics. I guess if uh, for the sort of fares pa passes piece of it, I think there's two parts to that. One is what is RTD doing now? But the other is what are the best practices outside of RTD on how we use those tools to actually um, increase ridership and increase equity, um, and, you know, because they're, we're looking for places where we can make recommendations for improvements. That I know is an area that has been identified over the years as, as being ripe. So I think those two pieces would help us answer that. Yeah, I, I, I would also suggest as a companion piece of that, sort of the, the, over, the I don't know how to say this correctly, the fair zone structure. Um, a lot of transit agencies used to have fair zones um, as part of their fair structure. I think a number of transit agencies around the country have gotten away from that because it can be so complicated that it discourages ridership um, and sort of simplifies, you know, you have to know which fair zone am I in, which fair zone am I going to, which fares, which fare pass do I have to buy, and sort of you know in in the vein of trying to simplify using the system and making it more convenient to encourage ridership. A lot of agencies got away from different fare zones and just have a kind of one fare structure. Um, so you pay a fare to ride, and um, I, I I would throw that in, Commissioner Jones, as sort of a piece of that analysis. Uh-huh, I think that's right. What other folks think? This is where I, I feel like we need to drive harder to get towards recommendations. And so this is the, the meat of of the work of the larger committee. And so everybody needs to speak out, speak up about where they think the most fruitful areas of inquiry are. So I um I will just acknowledge I I, I think I, I might might be struggling just a little bit because I'm trying to think of well what is a what could be done or result in a relatively quick uh, like a quick win or something along I, I don't like using that phrase but what will what could be done right now and what is a longer term change that may need to to take place over six months or so. I, I'm right there with you, Elise. I think the fares are a really critical issue. That's especially something we, we've heard loud and clear from folks for several years. Um, and the past program working group did a tremendous job um, a couple of years ago, really refining it. But I think even some folks would acknowledge, folks from that committee would even acknowledge they weren't able to get everything they wanted to get done, done. Um, and so I think that might be a good starting place for us to come up with some recommendations. As I'm thinking about this sub-regional model, I mean, I, I am going back to um, the governance sub-working group and some of the models that they had listed or that they were at least presented, Dallas-Fort Worth being one of them. I think BART is another one, LA Metro. And so I think that's where I'm struggling a little bit because I, I feel like I need to gain a little bit more understanding 
from that piece to then be able to inform this this subregional model. So don't know that I answered the question, but that's kind of where I'm sitting right now. Well, it sounds like all three topics that you mentioned, Matthew, are ones that people are interested in delving in. Um, and I and I'm not sure whether or not one is more timely than the other, or if they're all three really important. So I think part of it is perhaps what the information that we can get to inform the discussion and where, you know, is there one area that we can get the information faster and let's do it then? Let's order them in that that manner. Otherwise, I think we could just pick. RTD did provide uh, some information, uh, some data on the, the fair usage. And then we also obviously have uh, the, the work that was done by that um, fair committee. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the sub-regional model, since it's, uh, since it's being discussed in the um, governance subcommittee, perhaps we, perhaps we could wait and see where their conversation goes. So I would suggest, and it sounds like uh, this is this is um, from what I've heard. This is that this seems to be what people might want for the for the first topic, uh, but certainly not the last. Uh, to to dive in uh, to the fairs, uh, 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 the equity affairs, best practices. I, I bet I can uh, uh, find some uh, some best practices from around the country. Um, and then um, look in, in, in the, uh, the zone, uh, the fair zone structure as, as Ron suggested as well, and we can start to dive in there. Yeah, you know, okay, for sounds me, good. I, I think that's really good. I, I will say honestly that a lot of this is still a lot of education for me. And so uh, trying to ask for something to drive towards something, each, each thing we look at is new to me. So. Um, there you go. I, I, I don't know what to, I, I don't know enough to know what to ask. So I catch a good number of members of the committee. So we can dive in and provide you uh, some additional information uh, ahead of the next meeting uh, so that we can focus our discussion. That would be cool. Sounds good. That sounds great. The great. more stuff you can dump on us, I don't I, I kind of I don't know about everybody else, but like that that PowerPoint about the economy stuff was really interesting. And so it, it's, it's, and I feel like I get a little smarter, so. Great. Um, Troy? Thanks, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, thanks. So um, regarding the presentation from last night that was mentioned by the other speaker, there was a couple of other ones that I think would be valuable for this committee to, uh, look over um there was a rethinking ridership um presentation from uh some of our marketing folks that was very good there was a quality of life uh that uh survey that uh i thought had some very broad based uh information that may be good uh for the committee you know in referencing back to the last speaker and his uh desire for more information i guess i would just ask not getting what you need from us please let one of us know staff or lynn or myself and we'll be happy to get that forwarded as quickly as possible i know you've got a short time frame there should be some information available that perhaps you haven't received or uh would find helpful so please uh matthew and others uh madam chair uh let us know uh thank you very much yeah, thank, thank you, you for that Troy. Troy. I I think it would be helpful if there are presentations that you're getting that you think, gee, would be helpful to to get them to Matthew and have Matthew more Request. proactively send it out to the subcommittee, the link or the availability, rather, because I think there's there's a lot of information out there and it's hard to know what's particularly good and helpful to for our discussion. So feel free to to um, speak up on that and Matthew if you could proactively let us know when there's some good information that we need to be looking at I think that would be helpful I know we have the portal but 
keeping tabs on what's there is hard. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I, you know, I think Matthew did uh, send a notice about a couple of presentations out, and obviously a few of you uh, were able to um, to uh, monitor that perhaps last night. Uh, but a number of board members said last night that, um, you know, gosh, this presentation would be great for um, the accountability committee to to see. So we will do our best to be, uh, you know, proactive on that front. And I see uh, Barbara McManus's hand up from RTD, and uh, I'm sure she has some uh, input that's more valuable than mine, if you don't mind, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, great. I, I'm not sharing this, so okay. I'm so ready. we we are um, we are going to get those materials uh, to Matthew Matthew through jo uh, Josna, and um, we also are are double checking to make sure that the accountability committee, as well as the Dr. Cog team are all on the packet links that are sent out from RTD every week. Um, that way, uh, I don't know if you want to appoint someone to particular meetings or how, or you just want to look on your own how you organize that. But if you take a peek of the, at the agendas, then uh, you'll be able to see if there's anything relevant or that you find of interest that you may want to join the meeting for and we welcome everybody to do that. Um, so hopefully uh, that will help move things along and uh, Matthew you should probably have those presentations by close of business tomorrow I would think. Thank you, Barbara, and I'll um, I'll share them with the the, the committee. Um, also, yes, there there we have the portal, and we have part of that portal is um, Dr. Cog staff have a formal way of requesting information, but also uh, any um, uh, speakers uh, from RTD staff to come to our meetings, so that it's all so that it's all recorded, so that we track all of it. Uh, so um, if there's anything in particular that that anyone from from the committee wants or needs, uh, please let me know, and I can make the request on your behalf uh, for RTD uh, to to to, um, to get that for us. With that, are there any um, any other? questions or, or comments. Otherwise, we are running um, past time on the meeting, and I want to make sure that uh, we're not taking too much of your time from, from other business. Great. As well, always. We will... Oh, sorry? I said thanks as always. Oh, yep. no problem. Thank you. Great. Uh, the next meeting. Oh, and I, I don't have the next meeting in, in front of me, but it is on your calendar. Uh, so uh, we will see you again. Also, uh, the uh, the next full accountability committee meeting will be on Monday the 19th. Uh, but uh, we're looking to see if we if we can find another time during that day uh, uh, to meet. Um, and I sent out that doodle poll earlier this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. Bye, all. Have a great afternoon.